Bienvenidos, bienvenidos, welcome everybody, and uh, we are delighted because for this uh, particular streaming session of The Stream by The Stripando, we are joined once again when with two of our uh, favorite writers all around. They are coming uh, from the north of the continent, and let's welcome Zach Thompson and Lonnie Nadler. How are you doing, guys? Let's go first with, there he is, he's Zach. Good, thanks for having us, this is awesome. Excellent, excellent, and Lonnie, there you are. Hey, I'm, t I'm doing all right. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So first of all, th thanks a lot for, for accepting the invitation. Uh, we had the chance uh, of talking with uh, you guys before about the X-Men titles uh, at the moment. Perhaps we can uh, mention a little bit about that. It was one of the most interesting um, closure moments for, in this case, for the, for the X-Men and uh, something really in, innovative. But uh, before we go to the rest of the conversation here, allow me to introduce the rest of our merry band. And first we have uh, good Siko. How are you doing, Siko? Fine. Really uh, happy to have Second Lonely again with us. Excellent, excellent. And we have also Nightboy. Well, thank you for joining us again, uh, for having the, the, the character, the, the, the valor to join us. <laughs> the courage. The courage. Yeah, that, that, I was about to say the guts, but no, that's kind of uh, <laughs> not, 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 not as friendly. <laughs> all right, all right. So, um, and uh, actually, yes, thank you very much for uh, dealing with us uh, in these transmissions. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the storytelling that has been uh, coming around and today it's a really special day we we can say that it's a uh, uh, thompson and, and another day because today we actually had release of three books and we have a lot of announcements about some of the work that you are are, are doing guys and uh, it's uh, it's really fun because uh, we're receiving some weird noises okay perhaps that was some uh, some interference from a different planet or for, from the future and actually that's what we're going to talk about because um Today we have the release of uh, one of the first titles that is going to relaunch one of the lines of the Marvel Universe that it's uh, uh, located in the future. And uh, this is a 2000, uh, t the 2099 uh, universe that uh, it was really popular. A lot of the titles that were in there were like uh, really good, like the Spider-Man uh, 2099. And uh, you guys are writing one of these titles. Uh, Lonnie, can you tell us about the character, the main character that you are, uh, you guys are writing from this universe? Yeah, sure. So Zach and I uh, were lucky enough to get to do a sort of reboot, relaunch of Punisher 2099. Uh, and it's not anything like the Punisher 2099 from the 90s. Um, I guess it sort of is a little bit, but uh, our goal with it was to sort of push it in new directions and uh, explore some science fiction ideas that were important now as opposed to science fiction ideas that were important uh, 20 years ago. Uh, yeah, there's not much else I can say about it that won't ruin it. I don't know. It's a different, it's a new origin story, I guess, for, for Punisher 2099. All right. It's, and also it's, it's a, a version that's uh, quite colorful, I, I believe. Uh, Zach, can you tell us a little bit about the research that you guys did for this character? Because, well, at least the name and the date, it's something that it's fixed, but uh, you have a different take, right? Yeah. Um, we kind of went out of our way to... Uh, sort of think about the best Punisher runs and, you know, read the, the classic sort of like Garth Ennis stuff, but also <clears throat> think about ways that we can kind of update the Punisher in the future and, and have it stand like a revenge story that kind of stands for something different. Um, a big part of it for us was sort of like looking at all of the things that would kind of come to question. You would come to question if you were part of, uh, like a oppressive police force in the future. And so <clears throat> we looked at surveillance states. We looked at sort of like uh, drone cameras, facial recognition, facial scramblers, all kinds of stuff, and and built out a really uh, like interconnected story about uh, how Nueva York has sort of evolved and uh, how that kind of changes how uh, policing works and sort of like how the main character becomes disillusioned with that. Um, slowly all right all right so let's uh, follow, uh do a little bit of follow up about, uh, about this title and uh, night boy you have some questions ready right yeah uh, basically uh, you are uh, not negating but are you did you consider that this is the third time 
that there has been uh, Punisher to 19, 2099, right? The, the first one uh, we were talking right just right before the, you joined us. That the, the first one was the daughter of Electra Nachos and Frank Castle. The second was a kind of a Latin uh, character. I don't quite remember his name because it's Marvel and I don't pretty much read Marvel besides anything that you write. And uh, the third, and this is the third iteration of, a, of the character. What do you think? Are you negating or uh, acknowledging the existence of these two previous versions of the of the Punisher? Uh, are they kind of connected, or are you giving me the face right now that uh, we can't tell anything about that? Zach is doing that face. Zach is doing that. Face. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I don't have a clear answer for whether or not these other versions exist, but I think in our minds. The idea was that uh, Jake Gallows, who was the original Punisher 2099, was the only Punisher 2099. And then our story sort of, uh, for lack of a better term to describe it, screws with that, really changes that in a, in a way that people aren't anticipating. And um, it was really important for us that... I don't know about those other two versions, to be perfectly honest, but like one thing about Jake Gallows that we had a problem with was he's basically just Frank Castle. He's just a yeah. white, angry guy who is the exact same. They even look too similar. And we were like, well, that doesn't seem super interesting in 2019 to basically just take the Punisher and do it again in the future. So we were really concerned about how do you, how do you update Jake? How do you show that Jake himself is sort of an uh, out of date concept as a character. All right, Siko, uh, do you have the, a follow up question? Uh, it was the same. Uh, why choose uh, this character? But I, I think that is a first start for you guys. And basically, as you said, uh, Jake Ellos uh, was a ripoff from uh, Frank Castle. So uh, again, it's very important for you to express the society, no? In 2090. Yeah, I think a, a big thing is this is all sort of spun out of um, out, out of uh, Nick Spencer, who built out the 2099 uh, relaunch. He gave us, a, you know, a brief bible, and we had phone calls with him and the other writers about what they wanted this this world to be. And a big thing that Nick kept um, hammering down on is that this is a completely new version of 2099. And so the heroes that we see there are either not heroes at all yet, or not the heroes as we knew them from uh, the previous iterations of, of the 2099 series. And I think that was a really intelligent move because I, I think a lot of people are expecting to come back and get Jake Gallows and get these characters that they love. But that's not really what the goal of science fiction as a whole is. I think science fiction should always be pushing to uh, bring new stuff to the table and explore new themes and explore uh, new perspectives. Um, and so if 2099, as uh, Zach and I see it and as, as the rest of the 2099 team sees it, um, it's, about doing, it's about doing actual science fiction in the Marvel Universe. Um, and part of that is you know, not having the same people and someone with a more diverse background and seeing how that might look uh, compared to something, uh, you know, like you said, just a rip off of Frank Castle. And uh, one question, uh, let's go first with you, uh, Lonnie, and then with Zach. Uh, what, what kind of things uh, did you take in account uh, for adjusting this kind of take? Because, well, okay, the 2099 was a popular line at the moment that it was released. Uh, we obviously have changed, the time has changed, future has changed, and then we have, uh, for example, at, at the DC corner, we have a new take in, in, in the case of the Legion of Superheroes, that's uh, something that uh, Nightboy will ask uh, perhaps in, in, in a follow-up question, but for example, mm -hmm. what are the kind of things that you took in account for this version so it's more adapted to modern sensibilities to the as you mentioned the 2019 sensibilities because well uh it's no longer 100 years in the future it's only 80 years in the future so it's it's it should feel more according to our present time yeah uh there are a few things that that nick spencer set out out the gate um it, it was sort of the you know the idea that there's no screens 
in this world as we know them now. It's not the typical cyberpunk future, um, even though some of it ended up being a bit uh, too cyberpunky. Um, but then, you know, other things like the city was supposed to be constantly moving. Uh, the the city, like the skyscrapers, are built to a certain extent. There's uh, the levels of society and who lives underground and above ground, and there's parts that are totally off the grid and not off the grid. So it was a lot of just looking at, at sort of what um, specifically America is like right now and sort of interpolating um, all that stuff and then uh, wondering what it might look like 80 years from now. And then on top of that, Zach and I did, uh, like Zach said, we did a lot of research just looking into futurism in general and the kinds of technologies that the military is experimenting with or tech companies are experimenting with and wondering how those things might be employed by uh, different government agencies, police agencies, and, and how it might affect things like the prison system um, and the way people do their jobs and stuff like that. So it, it was just a lot of us getting to stretch the science fiction part of our brains, which we don't get to do as much as we would like sometimes at Marvel because you know, Zach come at this, we're huge fans of like Philip K. Dick and Isaac Asimov and stuff. And not everyone who reads Marvel wants heavy science fiction. Um, but I think this was the right place to do it. Uh, so there's a lot of, um, yeah, stuff like that. And then we, we read a lot of like Ghost in the Shell and watched the Ghost in the Shell movies because those were coming out around the same time as the original 2099. But they're like, they're far more present and and like way ahead of their time still in the ideas that they were talking about somehow. So we looked at a lot of that stuff as well um, and tried to let it inform the way we were telling the story um, and not trying to tell a story that was too generic, I guess. Hmm, I see. And let's go with you, Zach. Some of the things that you um, felt that uh, should be adjusted in this case. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, a some of the original 2099 they got right like i think the like the corporate future and that kind of thing it feels oddly sort of relevant but for us it was more about sort of taking the punisher as a character who's already <clears throat> a little bit you morally know, gray as to where they fit within the role of society and really looking at like what would be a system of events that would create that sort of character in the future um, apart from, you know, like the that my family got gunned down and now I'm, I'm mad at the world. It was a lot more about like, how does this future feel alienating and the systems that are in place that kind of keep people sort of participating in, um, you know, this capitalist sort of nightmare, um, you know, what happens when you wake up to it and, and what sort of character... Um, is created from sort of like looking at how to create equality in, in the world. And beyond that, sort of like the big thing for us was inverting the idea of the Punisher in a big way. And like, without saying too much, this, our mandate was, was like the Punisher becomes the Punisher to punish themselves rather than to punish other people. They feel like this is a responsibility they have to wear because of who they are rather you know, than what them. happened to them all right so let's go with uh, gilberto also known as nightboy uh, for the follow-up qu uh, questions or perhaps what you want to talk about a, a different title no it's uh, well pretty much uh, even along with a little bit with uh, the punisher title uh, it's uh, one of the things that, that you mentioned uh, well that mentioned it's uh, like uh, when, and it's something that I've seen uh, because I am a huge fan of the Legion of Superheroes. I think that I'm the only one in Mexico, something like that. <laughs> but, uh, but no, we're five, we are Legion. Uh, but uh, once that you get a, a character in the future, in the not so far future, because it's, uh, it's the case with the Punisher, and uh, you start uh, writing mm. histories, trying to link him to the character in the past, uh, his predecessor, or inspiration or whatever you want to call it uh, things uh, tend to come to become kind of uh, convoluted because uh, if uh, the writer that uh, is working in title in the present writes something that obviously uh, he thinks it's going to be a great story a great grounding story like uh, all the writers are trying to do things nowadays uh, immediately the book that's uh, placed in the future suffers a lot. I, I don't know if you remember uh, something like around the 1980s, 
1986, uh, when John Byrne decided to erase uh, the fact that Clark Kent was uh, was Superman, was known as Superboy first, and Superboy was the inspiration for the Legion of Superheroes. Immediately, the whole history became a huge mess that has been uh, 40 years, uh, more than 40 years, and uh, they are still trying to to redo it in a way that the, the fans are, are used to. And, and just to finish, are you afraid or are you concerned that some of the previous fans of the Punisher 2099 may be angry with you because you are not bringing back some characters? Okay, that's it, that's it. Bring it on, Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, like, that sort of shit is what Lonnie and I get up for in the morning. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you're, re you're reason to leave. <laughs> that's yeah. not true. You wake up to go out and hike. <laughs> I, yeah, it's my adrenaline. <laughs> I think that okay. it's a it's an idea of like you know, superhero comics are this really fluid medium that sort of exists unto itself, and there's nothing really like it out in the world. And you can sort of erase the past to tell a new story about the future that sort of stuff still exists people can go find it and if you create enough connective tissue um, between your story and the stuff that came before you create this nice homage and this really interesting sort of story plays with kind the of past but also tells a story about the future and i think comics are one of the only mediums that you can do that and as far as i'm concerned you know burn the past to the ground and, and do new shit because I think that some of the most interesting stories come from people who didn't have to think about those things, right? Before there was 80 years of continuity. So they were just like, fuck it, let's just make up cool stuff and, and see what sticks. And like, we've, we try really hard not to be beholden to anything that's been done before because that, I think your job at Marvel is to create new stuff. Um, and a lot of people get stuck in a trap that goes the opposite direction. I think also there's there's the idea of like that's one side of it, but the other side of it is we uh, is being educated about the past and like Zach and I do our research. We've been fans of Marvel for a long, long time, uh, as long as a lot of these these readers have been. And the idea that like we don't like these characters or we hate Marvel because we're changing something is like we're trying to give you more of what you like, but in a different way so that we're not rehashing the same thing over and over. So it's this line you have to walk of sort of like paying respect to the past, but also knowing that you don't, you shouldn't feel beholden to it and you should be able to tread new ground and, and make up new things and, and try to create uh, new stuff that people love. Um, and, you know, the idea that we're sort of messing around with stuff and we don't have an affinity for it is like, why would we spend our whole lives? Yeah doing this and every day getting up to write these characters just for the sake of like pissing people off you know it's like we do this because we love it and we love these characters as much as everyone else does exactly and uh, we have some questions for the audience uh, allow me to remind to the people who are joining us in our twitch channel this will be also uh, this will also be available at uh, both youtube and facebook uh, or facebook channel channels and also the audio version will be uh, ready uh, in a couple of days so if you're subscribed in in any in apple podcast or in spotify you will get it but uh, if you uh, are participating right now live in twitch uh, your questions and your comments will be actually can be read at the uh, at the bottom of the page and we have uh, a couple of comments uh, from uh, Jorge Israel Figueroa uh, Gif he just dropped uh, he is saying that he's just dropping by to say hi so hi uh, but uh, John Spirit Juan Espiritu uh, has a particular question and he says that um, if the in this occasion because we have all other titles like uh, Conan uh, 2099 and uh, a complete line that it's been relaunched and he's asking if uh, you guys obviously if you can tell us uh, yes, you can. Uh, if it's going to be something limited or it's going to be uh, something limited like with an, an alpha and an omega with a particular storyline for a, a particular period or uh, it's like a relaunch and uh, perhaps the, 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 the editorial right. plan is going to go forward until uh, our uh, budget allows it. Uh, yeah, I can answer that. Ah, okay, um, good, good, good. <laughs> and uh, perhaps more honestly than I should, but... <laughs> Uh, it is limited 
in that yes there is an alpha there's these one shots and then there's an omega issue um and it will be limited and it is designed to be limited uh unless fans and readers pick it up enough uh, that it makes it worth marvel's while to continue the series and it's not just 2099 that's like that it's every book with the exception of you know thor and the avengers and spider-man uh, every new book that comes out is generally limited until uh, it's proven that it can be a success and that fans will support it. So if there's, I say this and I'm being honest about it because if there's stuff you love um, that you're reading, you need to support it and you need to show the company that this is where your money is being placed and these are the creators that you want to support. Yeah, mm-hmm. you need to tell Marvel like as much as you possibly can because they do pay attention to social media and they do pay attention to the things that people are posting about and talking about. And it's important for these sorts of things that if you want to see like a new sort of like publishing arm of the Marvel universe, um, that sort of stuff doesn't happen if people just sort of don't support this kind of thing. Cause they go, they, they really believe to be going out on a limb when they're doing this kind of thing, whether or not that is actually the case, who knows, (laughs) but yeah. And it's, I don't just mean this for our book. It's like, if you love Daniel Kibble Smith's Loki, or, you know, if you love Spider-Gwen or whatever, it's it, all of it needs needs support as much as possible. And, and the company just needs to know that this is what people and readers want more of. And uh, let's actually, let's start with a campaign at this very moment, guys. I'm going to show, uh, share with you my, my uh, tweet deck account. I used starting a hashtag and it says, I want two t- 2099 issues of Punisher 2099 by Zach and Loni uh, tweeting at this very moment. So please retweet. Let's start the moment. Let's show Marvel that we want more of this title. Okay. There you That's have it. Awesome. All right. So uh, let's move to a different title. And Siko, we're going to, uh, with you. I believe that you have some questions about our blue spaceman uh, or our blue uh, favorite spaceman. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of. Uh, first, I would like to say to Loni and Zach that to be safe from the Punisher fans, because there are no many fans <laughs> from Punisher. Uh, 299 maybe have fans uh, for Spider-Man and Doom. They are the most su- su- successful ones yeah. of the last. Uh, for sure. Ravier? Uh, <laughs> Stan Lee. <laughs> Only. Yeah. But uh, no. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, John Doom. Uh, you are uh, telling us the story of John Doom that has recently debuted in the Marvel Universe because it was first on the <laughs> Marvel Cinematic <laughs> Universe. Uh, he is a uh, the great, 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 great father of the one of the Guardians of the Galaxy, the original one. Uh, but there are uh, so many differences between them, no? Because it's the the John Doe of the future is kind of nature guy, uh, all, all organic. He's thin. Uh, very ethic, <laughs> a very ethic person, and John Doe from the Guardians of the Galaxy Cinematic Universe. Uh, it's the contrary. What is the challenge to to get these uh, characters the uh, front to front? I mean, like part of the appeal of the entire book for us was that you. By putting those two characters together, you basically have this like internal conflict engine that allows these two guys to always be opposed to one another. And it's a really easy way to show how different they are because you just put them in the same room and they'll never be able to agree about anything. Um, and that's something that you know was baked into it from the very beginning. the The book originally actually came to into being because we. We didn't know that much about the original Yondu other than he just looked different. And then we both were like getting ready to pitch cosmic books. Um, and we started reading the original Guardians of the Galaxy. And we uh, we call him Yondu 3000 just because that's the easy way for us to sort of make oh. a connection between the two. So 
uh, we were like, holy shit, Yanu 3000 is super cool. And he's just like, he's so much different than the Yandu that people know. He's this pious individual, this family man who is scared of technology. And he's, you know, most, I'd say most modern comic book fans don't know much about Yandu 3000. And so we emailed our editor and we're like, we want to do a, like a Guardians of the, the original Guardians of the Galaxy reboot. And he was like, no one wants that. <laughs> But he's like, what did you like about that team? And we were like, well, Yandu is really interesting. And then he was like, Yandu, let's talk on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then it was born from that. It, it was it was legitimately like the the challenge, the, uh, pr- the perspective challenge of writing those two characters at odds with one another was where the seeds of the book were born. This uh, Jodu event is a mini series, no five numbers, I yeah. believe. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of related to the Donny Cates closure, or it's related to the Ali Wing new title, or uh, it's just uh, an exercise. You take it away, Lonnie. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it, it's vaguely related to Donny stuff in that it's sort of uh, if. It deals with the fallout of, of the uh, extinction of the Nova Corps uh, that, that was dealt with in Donnie's book. So um, it, it's tangentially related to what Donnie's doing, um, but it also sort of stands on its own. You don't have to have read anything before it or after it for it to make sense. Uh, and that was sort of the goal was to <laughs> tell a story that fit within the greater Marvel universe, um, but functioned on its own in terms of being, you know, this like crime Western in space. Uh, we wanted it to not feel like anything else at Marvel at the moment, uh, specifically. So that's why we avoided tying it into to too much else. Uh, we were talking right uh, before this <coughs> kind of story among the, you know, uh, the things that that uh, we noticed uh, in John <coughs> number one, and one was the the art. Uh, besides the the way that you have uh, structured the history, uh, that the, the the present, uh, the future coming to haunt the present, something like in a Terminator, uh, way more amical than friendly than uh, than Terminator, right? But uh, the the art, the art feels pretty westerny. Uh, if I don't know if that word exists, it, it doesn't exist. I just made it up right now. It, it's a new word, and uh, it kind of I don't know give this the feel that. Uh, there is such a, it's not anarchy, but a lack of a, a future structure or a space structure like people like to, to think about when you talk about spaceships and uh, alien civilizations and stuff like that. There's something that feels pretty old, but with the, the new take. Are you involved in the decisions of, you know, we want it to feel this way, we want it to make it the people uh get this impression about what's uh, what's coming on because we are talking about future uh 3000 and we are talking about uh interstellar space or i don't know alien civilizations and the final question is uh, really what uh, yeah you know uh, really you know what okay, sorry I had to say that i had to take that out of my system <laughs> <laughs> we had to do it the exact same way. We were like, really? This is what we're doing? We do it every day. <laughs> <laughs> but like the, right. the interesting thing, so to like go back to the first thing you said is like the the decision to make it a grungy, dirty book, like that was done one hundred percent on purpose. We had that in mind from the get go. And then when the opportunity came along to work with John McCrae, um, that was just sort of like the perfect uh, person for the book like John brings a level of uh, quality storytelling that like Lonnie and I are in, indebted to in every page of every issue of that book um, John's a consummate professional who has been drawing comics probably longer than both of us have been alive and and like he you know he make he reminds us of it every day as well <laughs> that we're just like young little idiots that are figuring it out But he's been so good in terms of like coming at this book with the same perspective that we have and that we want to make a dirty, grungy space book. Um, And like 
you know, there's nothing else at Marvel that looks like it right now and probably won't be ever again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we were, we were uh, saying that uh, it gets us the, the feel that uh, uh, talking about the distinguished competition, that book that uh, was written by Jimmy Palmer and Justin Gray, that was Jonah Hex, all Western, uh, all Star Western, uh, Jonah Hex. And it, uh, there, there was some issues that uh, you get that, uh, that feel, that impression that the book is old, that the characters are re really old. And uh, <laughs> there's something that, that uh, McKay and you, it's not just the drawings, it's not, not just the art, it's just the story itself that really gets you down to, to the down and dirty of uh, the Western uh, part of the space, if uh, there's mm -hmm. such a thing. And uh, I, I knew it was uh, just due to writing the first page of Blue Moon. It, it was good friend. Good friend. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but it really feels uh, like, like those old comic books. Uh, and I know that you will be talking about this a little bit later. But I'm sorry to say that, but this feels a little bit more Western-y that, here comes that word again, uh, western -y that uh, on Done by Blood. The, 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 the drawings, the art that I've seen from my, uh, mm -hmm. from my blood, it's, it's pretty cool. But uh, John Doe feels way more, more Western than uh, that this book. Yeah, I think, I think with Yondu, we, we really wanted it to feel... Uh, we, we looked at a lot of what the, the current uh, Marvel Universe cosmic stuff has been for the past uh, you know, decade or so. Um, and it's always been this sort of glossy, uh, high-tech uh, space station stuff. And, and um, that's cool. And that really works well for like the cinematic universe. And it's exciting. Um, but Zach and I weren't particularly interested in, in just uh, doing that because a lot of people have done it and a lot of people have done it way better than we could. Um, and so, yeah, we wanted to see like, Certainly not the entire Marvel Universe has this awesome tech that works perfectly every time. Uh, and we wanted to really see what the underbelly looks like uh, of, of not just one planet, but many, and see how uh, you know, people struggle to live throughout the Marvel Universe and uh, what different races look like and stuff like that. So that's a theme that comes up again and again is you know, these, these races and these planets that are forgotten about um, by people like the Avengers and by the Nova Corps and by the Guardians, what do they what do they look like uh, and how do they exist here? And Yondu is the perfect character to explore that with because, you know, he's a criminal and that's the world he operates in. All right. So I have a very fast question uh, uh, before we we move to perhaps uh, a, a bit a bit about the future books and 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 something from the past that actually was re released right now in a, a different format, but. Uh, uh, first uh, question, Zach, you are still in there. So, uh, John Doe versus the Mandalorian. Uh, who should I bet for? <laughs> Yandu is a greasy piece of shit, so he'll find a way to beat the Mandalorian. Okay. Okay, it's like Batman versus Captain America. You you, you bet on the guy who is going to actually uh, cheat. Oh, okay. yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, Siko uh, was mentioning uh, about the title that it uh, actually was announced, and I believe it's going to be released on on, on February of uh, 2020. Uh, and uh, it's something that looks really interesting, and it's actually something that we have mentioned, uh, very uh, Western, like we very Westery. Uh, Western is a new word. <laughs> <laughs> That's the word. So can you tell us a little bit about this title and uh, what are the, the, the expectations that we as readers can have besides having a great story from you guys? <laughs> Low expectations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's all, that's all I got. <laughs> all right, so let's lower our expectations because anyway, you always blow our minds. And uh, as uh, they were mentioning, we actually had uh, Jimmy Palmiotti in a previous interview, and we were—I uh, I can say that he actually did a digital signature of one of my issues of um, All Star Western. So uh, hopefully, we can invite you uh, in the near future so I can actually repeat and have a virtual signature for a future comic. So it's going to release on 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 on, on February. Uh, it's going to be published uh, with Aftershock. Is that correct? That's, that's right. right. All right. So, uh, for example, um, between working with different editorial uh, editorials, uh, you have been working also with uh, with Bolt. Uh, you have been working obviously with Aftershock, with Marvel. Uh, how do you feel 
about the different kind of, of ways that you can work with uh, with these different teams. Obviously, uh, they, they, they are wonderful in different ways. And you can see because if we want to read something like sci-fi with you guys, we go to Marvel. If we want to read something from horror, we go to a different a, a different uh, oh, perspective. So how do you feel about the, difference, uh, the different windows for your stories that you have found so far? Well, I mean, like working with every publisher uh, sort of, it, it creates its own set of challenges and limitations, but it's also about the people that you sort of surround yourself with at these publishers who kind of help uh, create insights to the story that you're telling and, you know, help elevate the things that are unique about what project you've brought to them. Um, more often than not, you know, it's not a surprise that working at Marvel comes with a certain set of stringent rules that sort of can't be broken. And there's a box that you have to play in and you can find creative ways to do things within that box, but you're not really um, ever allowed to leave it. Um, whereas when you're doing creator owned, the challenge is usually the opposite where you're like, how do I build a box that I can stay in? <laughs> so I don't go off the rails every 10 seconds. We usually and, do. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> we often do. <laughs> um, but the, the thing is, is that uh, the, you know, the unique opportunity with creator own is that you're creating a world, you're welcoming people in, you can't rely on people's prior knowledge about what they, they know about these characters or anything. So you have to really think about every little piece and how it all fits together. And um, Marvel, you can rely on people's knowledge of the world or, some of the things that are already built in that are sort of like loopholes that kind of solve problems for you. Um, and, you know, both are good in their own way. Um, you know, I think for us, what we try to do is whenever we work at a certain publisher, we create a story that is specifically suited to the needs of that publisher and the story that we want to tell at the time. And that will be good for the audience that that uh, publisher appeals to. I think that if you don't think about that kind of stuff, you can kind of get yourself into a position where you created a book and you don't have an audience for it. All right. Uh, Lonnie, something that you want to add? Um, no, I mean, I mean, I think Zach kind of got it. There are, all these publishers are all very different and they're all the same in some regards. Uh, we, I guess I can say we, if, if we didn't like working at any of them, we, we probably wouldn't be doing it. Uh, and, <laughs> hmm. Doing uh, doing Marvel work is very different than doing creator owned work. I, like I, I don't even see it as the same, the same kind of writing, the same job anymore. Like they're they're so different to me that it's almost two different mediums that, that I'm working in. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something I think that took me a long time to to come to terms with. Uh, and I think you have to because uh, there's something that Matt Rosenberg said to us. Uh, a while ago he said creator own books are always going to be a marathon and marvel books are always a sprint uh and it it feels like that a lot because marvel stuff just happens quicker there's more people involved um and it's sort of like you start it and then it's done and before you can even blink whereas creator own stuff is like we zach and i live in those worlds for you know years at a time um so yeah it's, it's just very different it's, it's yeah, hard I mean to compare them even to go back to like Undone by Blood, like we came up with Undone by Blood, I would say when? Probably the middle of 2018, maybe even earlier than that. Probably earlier. Yeah. And so like by the time people read that book, it, it has been in our heads for about two years. And not only that, but like to, you know, we're currently writing the last issue of, of Yandu. Um, and that book is like on the stands now. Undone by Blood comes out in February and we finished writing it months ago. Um, and it's something that like, you know, you have that opportunity with a creator own book to sort of like prepare it as a whole and sort of like release it and, and know sort of with confidence sort of how people are going to consume it. And like, where as with a Marvel book, you're sort of making it up as you go along sometimes. And it's not a bad thing. It's just a different thing. Yeah, and I, I just checked, Zach. We came up with Undone by Blood at the very start of 2017. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so almost three years there. 
Okay, yeah. so we're going to go to a final round of questions. But before that, uh, have you guys think this is a, a running gag that we have in this in these shows because most of our guests have come from Ahoy Comics. So how do you think about Ahoy, Ahoy Comics for a future title? <laughs> <laughs> we were actually I thinking mean, in, in, into putting uh, the stream, the name of the show, powered by Ahoy because I believe that <laughs> half of our shows are with the guests from there. <laughs> Honestly, the, the stuff that, that Ahoy is putting out, I haven't read all of it, but but it's um, it looks like the stuff I've read is great, and the stuff that I haven't read looks amazing, and I know the response has been amazing for it. So, um, we're certainly open to to talking to them. We haven't yeah. yet. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Nightboy, uh, let's let's write some messages to our favorite uh, editor in chief from that company. So, yeah. let let me, we did that for uh, Mark Russell. Let's do this for uh, some of our other friends. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I said, being a legionnaire that comes with his, with his uh, not those perks, uh, has, a, has something right. Uh, it's advantages. A, yeah, it's advantages. Uh, before we go, uh, and uh, first, cut to, I don't know, to congratulate you, because as usual, you do amazing, you both do amazing jobs. And there's, there's one question. Uh, how do you keep each of your stories apart from each other when you are writing? Because uh, from what we have seen and from what you have told us, uh, you have uh, you are loaded with stories and uh, your schedule is pretty full. So how do you keep each character on its own book and not crossing stories or characters or characteristics of each, uh, each one of the, the characters in other books? I mean, I think it helps that the stuff that we typically work on, like Lonnie and I make a concerted effort that every project is very different than the last. Um, we try really hard to dabble in different genres and we try really hard to make sure that um, we're always stepping outside of our comfort zone. I think that like um, we had, we were faced with this unique opportunity right after our first book came out where we were like, well, if we wrote another noir, people would probably buy it right away. And then we would be known as like these crime guys. And then we're like, what would people not expect from us? <laughs> hmm. We'll retell Dante's Inferno. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Surprise, didn't, people didn't buy it. Easier. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. And uh, Nightboy, uh, do you have a final? Uh, sorry, Siko, uh, do you have a final question before uh, we go? Uh, yeah, but I would also like to recommend uh, a book from Zach uh, that I just read. It was the the replacer. One shot. Oh, thank you. And it was very personal, no? Uh, we were talking about uh, the most personal stuff that you can write in in the in indie companies, and it is and it is an example, no? And Lonnie now has an, uh, also uh, Black Stars above, no? That's right. Yeah. Great stuff, both of them. You are also amazing individually and together thank you it means a lot yeah some some people think we suck together some people oh. think we suck apart <laughs> the truth is we always suck yeah. <laughs> it's right down the line <laughs> all right no and uh, i i uh, actually as, as Siko was saying uh, guys and we have mentioned before sorry if this uh, it seems like we're just uh, i don't know like uh uh, giving you a lot of uh, a lot of um, how, how do you say it in English? If uh, we're giving you a lot of of, of compliments, but uh, seriously, the, the the work that you both uh, have been doing it's it's amazing. I was mentioning it to my friends, and actually in the Stripando I have recommended the Stripando is the the regular podcast that we have that is not with interviews, so it's uh, more boring. It's actually boring, uh, but I have been recommending in this case Black Stars Above because it's something that is really outstanding. We have the chance to to talk also before about the replacers, and uh, as we mentioned. Uh, well, I believe that in Spanish we have a phrase that it's juntos son dinamita. Together you are like dynamite, guys. So you 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 both are outstanding, and together it's 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 even more explosive. So uh, 
th thanks a lot for the the quality in the work that you have because uh, believe me after this interview is done you will get a nomination at least for one Eisner for the for the next the, the next <laughs> I am serious, guys. I am serious. People who have been invited in yeah. here, they either have long runs from the, from their titles or they have Eisner nominations. So, believe us. Or perhaps you will be invited to a different editorial. So, hey, I'll, I'll take it. Just saying. Just saying. Okay. So, if. Oh, um, is, there is more uh, individual projects in the future? Yeah. 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 Both, yeah. both working on stuff uh, together and, and apart. So there's no shortage of stuff coming out. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. It's worth mentioning that the stuff about being nominated for an Eisner is it, true. The thing is that the people that come here and get, get nominated never wins. But you get nominated. <laughs> yeah, that, that's important, right? Hey. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll take matter, it. With our <laughs> part, so. <laughs> then I can you tell people. Uh... No. You, you can say nominated writers nominated for the Eisner writers and that that sounds pretty cool uh, you, have you have to say, have to say you have to say Eisner losing writer yeah <laughs> no it, it was actually silver silver medal uh, winning for the winning. Eisner <laughs> All right. So uh, uh, with this, we're pretty much uh, ending the uh, tonight's transmission. Thank you very much for everybody who has been joining us and uh, leaving comments in Twitch. Also, uh, both uh, Juan Espiritu and Jeff uh, were, were saying about the outstanding work that you have been doing in, in these titles. And uh, of course, uh, people who is, uh, it's uh, ready to, to learn more about this can can follow you on Twitter. Is that correct? Uh, Zach, they, they can find you as Zach B. Thompson. And Lonnie, I was mentioning just right before we started the transmission, he's just uh, a regular human, Lonnie Nadler, at Twitter. So they can find you in there. Uh, something else that you want to add, guys? I believe that we cover about the, the upcoming titles, but something perhaps that I was missing? No, I think that's it. Yeah, I think we covered it. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Zach and Lonnie. Uh, it was a wonderful opportunity, and hopefully we will have you again as guests uh, for a, an upcoming uh, transmission. And hopefully you will come with your... Uh, I will uh, change the title that you were actually looking uh, in, in the guest line. It says, for example, Lonnie Nadler, talented writer. It will say Lonnie Nadler, uh, silver, medal, silver medal winning for an upcoming uh, Eisner Award. So. Perfect. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having us, guys. No, it was a real pleasure. Always a pleasure. Yeah, Zach, it's always great. Lonnie, a real pleasure having you. And uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity. So with this, we are pretty much ending this transmission. Thank you for everybody who was... Uh, looking at this remember that if you want to support this kind of shows uh you can support us at uh, patreon.com slash the i will actually write it down because it's kind of hard to understand if you are following this transmission in english but don't worry we always take your money and we will find a way to to find it thank you very much and goodbye even canadian dollars <laughs> <laughs>